London. Prime Minister Churchill has returned to London from his latest Quebec conference with President Roosevelt. He comes home as the Allied armies are massed on the German frontier and in places have marched beyond. In a series of victories without parallel, the Germans have been blasted from one occupied territory after another. Vichy. The liberation of Vichy was an unforgettable milestone, for here was the symbol of the Nazi puppet government of Marshal Pétain. Brussels. Belgium, too, is free. The House of Representatives named Prince Charles to the office of regent. He will act temporarily for his brother, King Leopold, now a prisoner in Germany. Marseille. One of the great prizes of liberation is Marseille, France's first port. On hand to examine German demolition are British, French, and American naval officials. These U-boat pens were still under construction when the Germans fled. Toulon. The harbor at Toulon, chief French naval port in the Mediterranean, lay strewn with men of war. The French Navy saw to it that the Germans would never make use of these vessels. Bologna. The coastal guns at Bologna are now in allied possession. La Havre. This second port of France is another monument to Nazi vandalism. Here too the allies found unfinished U-boat pens. The Germans had long since abandoned faith that the submarine would bring them victory. Brest. The bitter and prolonged siege preceded the fall of Brest. The official surrender, effected by an American general, was enacted in the main square. Dover. This valiant English town is finally free of German shells. For four long years, her people have lived virtually underground, adjusting their lives to the dictates of disaster. For 1,510 days, the Nazi big guns across the channel were free to pump 16-inch shells into Dover and neighboring towns. As far back as 1940, British troops were drafted to aid the beleaguered townspeople. But Dover, with all her scars, went about her daily duties. Calais. Now Calais is in Canadian hands. And the long trial of Britain's Hellfire Corner is over. As the Canadians approached, a truce was granted to evacuate thousands of civilians. The exodus began across the Calais Canal. The surrender of the Nazi garrison illustrates once again one of Germany's most conspicuous military blunders, the practice of leaving isolated pockets of forces behind at the mercy of the mighty Allied armies. attack was resumed on a grand scale, Lancasters, Halifaxes and Typhoons went in for the kill. The Canadian artillery sent in salvo after salvo. It took the Nazi commander, who had sworn he would never be taken alive, two brief hours to change his mind. When he surrendered, 6,000 healthy German troops surrendered with him.
These guns have fired their last shell at the civilians of Great Britain. They were only as strong as the men who manned them. Another white flag has replaced the swastika. On him, one of the most dramatic and gallant feats of this war has been performed by the first Allied Airborne Army. Four of the five Dutch landings were a complete success. The fifth, though it fought a losing isolated battle, contributed immeasurably to the victories of the others. Ground forces made quick contact with most of the landing parties, ousting the enemy from his water-defended positions. The landing at Grave was typical. Reinforced by paratroopers and quickly supported by land forces, the airborne men secured their objectives in record time. The greatest prize of the airborne operation was the huge bridge over the lower Rhine at Nijmegen. It is almost two kilometers long, 14 times the length of the bridge at Arnhem. By far the highest honors, however, have gone to the men who dropped at Arnhem. Their objective was some 90 kilometers beyond General Dempsey's spearhead. A total of 8,000 men landed in the sector of the River Lech in Holland. The record of their valiant stand was immortalized by an army cameraman. Great numbers of paratroops joined the glider-borne units. They established positions which thwarted every German effort to cross the lake. Their job was to hold out until the land forces made contact. German prisoners were taken the moment the operation was underway, and the airborne troops fought with unparalleled ferocity every minute until they were commanded to retire. Men of the Dutch resistance movement revealed the disposition of the German forces. This country bungalow was converted into a headquarters. As the days wore on, the Germans mustered every man possible against this relatively small force. Help did not get through, and every day the enemy circle grew tighter. Supplies were dropped as long as weather permitted flying. At dusk, Allied target indicators revealed that bombers were active against the enemy. But still the land support troops did not come, and orders were sent for the beleaguered unit to withdraw. After one of the most heroic episodes of this war, the men of Arnhem, now only 2,000 strong, retired. These men did not fail. In the nine days and nights they fought, they held the Nazis back. Thanks to their courageous sacrifice, Nijmegen Bridge, undamaged, is in allied hands.